Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market on the S&P 500. Positive Friday, Monday this morning. Just about positive, 0.1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York, coming up, Israel preparing for the next phase of retaliation, helping to fuel a major rally in the Treasury market as Fed officials play down the need to do more. We begin with the big issue, the Treasury market rebounds. In terms of the bond market, the bond market's around. There's been such an incredible move in yields, particularly over the last month. The upward trend in yields. It's not surprising to see a little bit of a move back. It is a, a risk off sentiment. Risk aversion that you've seen over the last few days or so. I mean, clearly there's an element of safe haven status going on here. Treasuries to behave at that safe haven status like they have in the, pe in the past. Given the Fed's piece lately, it's the reaction from financial markets that has finally caused the Fed to maybe take a pause. The market is doing a little bit of the work for them. A lot of the work for the Fed. Marcus is doing the Fed's job for them and maybe they won't have to go quite as far. The Fed is likely done with hikes. We do think that bond yields will try to lower from here. We can't you know, believe uh, that there's been a pivot in the space of two or three days. It's really hard to know where we go from here. Joining us now to discuss Jim Bianco of Bianco Research, Mike Contopoulos of RB Advisors. Jim, looking at this move this morning, yields down something like 10 basis points right the way through the curve. Two's out to the 10-year yield down 10 basis points to about 470. Jim, in your mind, is that risk aversion or Fed speak? Oh, I think it's probably more Fed speak at this point. If you go back 24 hours ago, the bond market had reacted to the weekend events, and I'm talking about futures trading and you know, German bonds at this point, and it was largely unchanged. Then we got a bunch of Fed speak yesterday about higher for longer and no more rate hikes. And then you had the big move throughout the, uh, yesterday. So it seems like it's more about L Lori Logan, who's the Dallas Fed president, Richard Jefferson, who spoke yesterday, than it is about what happened in the Middle East over the weekend. Jefferson, Logan, Daly, all over the last week. Mike, it's kind of amusing, isn't it? They're happy for the, the market to do the work for them. Then the market stops doing the work for them. What's that going to mean I, for their next meeting? Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing, Jonathan. I mean, you know, another couple of days of lower yields and all of a sudden hikes are going to be back on the table. I, I just don't see, given the, the labor market uh, dynamics that are clearly, you know, maybe not, you know, white hot, but red hot, some of the bottoming and the PMI data, et cetera, that, you know, the Fed is not going to get another hike in at some point. And, you know, instead of saying, you know, asking the question, are they going to pause? in November, are they going to hike again this year? You know, maybe the market needs to start asking how many times are they going to hike in 2024? Um, you're just not seeing the slowing that, you know, many, many market participants thought that you would see. Inflation's not anywhere close to 2%. And it doesn't seem like things are breaking yet, just as when earnings are starting to accelerate. And so, you know, surely at some point, there will be a point in time where where uh, the Fed is done and, and cutting interest rates and probably have a hard landing. But I just don't see that in the next six months or so. It's the three-month rolling recession call, Jim Bianco, and it keeps rolling. It keeps getting pushed out. This is from Morgan Stanley, Seth Carpenter and the team over there, holding on to this baseline view that the last hike from this Federal Reserve was July. And ultimately, they're relying on the noticeable slowing in the fourth quarter to stay the Fed's hand. Jim, you're taking the other side of that, aren't you? Yes, I, I am. Um, the whole idea that the recession is one to two quarters away is now going on 18 months. And I guess if you say it long enough, eventually those one to two quarters away will eventually materialize. But right now, it hasn't been. And if you look at the payroll number from last week and some of the recent data, and even the upbeat outlooks that we've had going into this earnings season, and I know it's early, uh, it's hard to make the case that we're seeing some kind of a real recessionary slowing in the economy. Yes, there are sectors of the economy like housing that are struggling, but there's always sectors of the economy that are be struggling. So uh, the idea that don't worry, we're going to see a slowing of the economy to justify the Fed being done and rate cuts next year has been wrong for 18 months. And I just don't see evidence right now that the tide has turned and that that's gonna be the right call. So Mike, are you actually considering rate hikes from this Fed next year? 
Oh, absolutely. I think you have to consider it. Uh, I don't know why why you wouldn't, Jonathan. I mean, earnings growth, to Jim's point, is starting to reaccelerate. I mean, the earnings cycle bottomed several quarters ago, and growth is just still too hot. Um, you know, I think they're going to pause uh, I, I, at some point for a quarter or, or, or you know, a couple meetings. But my guess is their hand's going to be forced and that they're going to have to hike again at least a couple more times. I mean, financial conditions aren't that tight at this particular juncture. I mean, this is really a big conundrum for the Fed because the, the stronger growth is today, the harder the landing later. The problem is just, you know, to Jim's point, when is later? Is it uh, six months from now? Is it a year from now? We don't know. And and I think between now and whenever that landing is, uh, yeah, the Fed's going to probably have to hike again. Mike McKee, Daly, Jefferson, Logan, all suggesting this market is doing the work for them. It's not anymore, Mike, is it? Well, we're uh, one day into that, not anymore. But let's take a look at what we've seen so far. The 10-year uh, note yield, uh, along with uh, the belly of the curve, rising a lot. And that's been pushing up real rates. You can see the 10-year, the white there, the real rate in uh, the blue. And that's what the Fed officials are talking about. And as you mentioned, we've heard from a number of them over the last couple of days, including uh, one that got a lot of attention, and that was Lori Logan, because she's been a real hawk. Uh, she noting if the term premiums rise, they could do some of the work of cooling the economy for us, leaving less need for additional monetary policy tightening. That followed very similar remarks from Mary Daly, the San Francisco Fed Bank president, a few days ago, uh, noting that financial conditions have tightened a lot, and that might mean they don't have to take further action. We'll see on Thursday what we get out of CPI, and we'll see if these bond market moves continue. You can see here the difference. The bond market was closed yesterday, and I said we needed to watch what would happen today. Whether you call it a flight to safety or whether you call it Fed speak driven, you can see that yields have come down on the 10, and that has pushed up just a little bit the odds of a Fed hike in November. But we're only at 16 percent, down from uh, Monday morning at about 30 percent. So at this point, the bond market writing off the Fed. But as we have seen so many times, we can reverse that very easily. Mike McKee, thank you, sir, for the update. Tomorrow, of course, Fed minutes, PPI data on to Thursday. You'll get CPI data. Looking at the bond market screen this morning, big rally, yield to lower. Two reasons for it out there at the moment. The Fed speak, some doves, Logan, Jefferson, Daly as well. Mike McKee talked to that, spoke to that. Also, that risk aversion flow. Didn't get it yesterday. Treasury market was closed. Getting it a bit this morning. Jim Bianco, I remember you saying weeks ago that oil would take center stage. Has it taken center stage? Oh, I think it has. I mean, we've already got about a 25 percent rally since late June. And now with the tensions in the Middle East and the big 4 percent rally yesterday, we're all going to be focused on oil. Has it taken center stage to bother markets? Not yet. But if this uptrend continues and reinserts itself, I do think it will become front and center. And it is probably the market metric that we'll be watching to see what kind of a market or financial impact we can expect from Middle East tensions. So, Jim, with that in mind, if higher oil prices is the price to pay here in the market off the back of this, is that a reason for bonds to rally on risk aversion, which leads to higher prices, or a reason for the bond market to sell off on inflation risk? Which one is it? Yeah, that's the old uh, conundrum with uh, oil. Is it a tax on the consumer or is it inflation? I think in this environment, it's more inflation. Now, I don't expect the Fed to raise rates because oil goes up. But the default argument is if oil were to go up and take gasoline prices with it, it further pushes any idea of a rate cut well into the future. That you just can't do it if you're wanting to see, if you're seeing national price of gasoline go through $4. That is cutting rates. Uh, so don't expect them to raise them. Just you could forget about rate cuts. And Mike, do you share that conclusion? Yeah, I think that I think that's right. I mean, if you changed uh, monetary policy, you know, based on oil prices, you'd be changing, you know, from tightening to loosening every other month. And so I agree with Jim. It's not going to change necessarily the Fed's calculus. It probably for a period of time has a bigger impact on inflation. But listen, there's certainly a level to which, you know, gas and oil goes to where it really does start to to hurt growth. Um, you know, I'm not sure if that's north of 100 or 110, uh, whether or not the economy can handle 85 uh, or 90 should be is, is probably the case. Um, but, you know, certainly level does matter into where it sort of begins to to go from inflationary pressures that are the concern to growth, uh, growth concerns. 
but we're certainly not there yet. And so I think, yeah, it, it's more of an inflationary impact, and uh, but not going to affect the Fed very much. Mike, give me your bond market call now. Considering rate hikes in 2024, what are you considering on a 10-year yield? You know, it's, it's interesting, Jonathan. I have a little bit of a, a different view, I think, than a lot of folks out there. Um, in my mind, the, the more the Fed hikes, um, the safer it is to be in something like the 10-year. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but think about what's happened over the last several months. The Fed's ratcheted down hikes from 75 to 50 to 25, uh, has also ratcheted down the pace of hikes to every other meeting or so. To, at the same time as growth and inflation are, are stubbornly elevated, if not reaccelerating. So the market is telling you that the Fed is losing credibility. And I think that's why you've seen this bear steepening. The long end of the yield curve, of course, represents growth and inflation expectations. So there's an irony if the Fed actually can get back into control uh, in the market narrative by indicating uh, some more hawkishness, you may actually see stabilization in the long end of the yield curve as the market starts to price, you know, a, a come down of growth and inflation and ultimate hard landing. That's, of course, what's been priced out. So I think that uh, at current levels, you want to be pretty fairly balanced uh, in your interest rate risk. Take maybe some cyclical duration out there from counter cyclical duration uh, and, you know, avoid credit risk, as I've been saying for some time. Big rally this morning. Mike, thank you for your view. Mike Contopoulos there and Jim Bianco. Big rally in the bond market. Looking at the equity market this morning on the S&P 500. Positive here by 0.1%. Let's get you some movers going into the open. Here's Abby. John, it's really interesting that that big rally in the bond market with yields down is not driving a big rally for stocks. Right now, investors tiptoeing through in a bullish manner. But one tech stock that is climbing higher uh, is Microsoft, up about four tenths of one percent. Apple's, Tesla's, those are still down just a little bit. So investors are a little bit cautious here. Microsoft also getting a lift from Morgan Stanley, naming it, conti continuing to name it a top pick on AI, cloud, and security strength. Lockheed Martin, after rallying about nine percent yesterday, the best day since March of 2020 amid the Israel. Hamas conflict now heading to an up a uh, third up day in a row up two percent in the pre-market and then Palantir returning to technology the data software company has disclosed a new army AI contract worth up to 250 million dollars investors seem to like it that stock up 2.8 percent and perhaps a little bit of a lift there uh, from yields down John Abby thank you coming up on this program is ready Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu standing strong we didn't want this one it was forced upon us in the most brutal and savage way. But though Israel didn't start this war, Israel will finish it. The Israeli military preparing for the next phase of conflict. Team coverage up next. I want to thank President Biden for his unequivocal support. I want to thank leaders across the world who are standing with Israel today. I want to thank the people and Congress of the United States of America. In fighting Hamas, Israel is not only fighting for its own people, it is fighting for every country that stands against barbarism. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu praising President Biden for his support. The Israel-Hamas conflict entering its fourth day. Israel carrying out strikes overnight and building a new base near the Gaza Strip to accommodate additional troops. President Biden speaking about the conflict at 1 p.m. Eastern time today. Let's get to our team coverage. Bloomberg's Ethan Bronner in Tel Aviv and Anne-Marie in Washington, D.C. Ethan, first to you. What is the state of play as we wake up this morning in New York looking over to your Israel? Hey, Jonathan, look, I mean, it, the storm clouds are gathering. We have hundreds of thousands of men in uniform on the border. We have people driving away in southern Lebanon, afraid of what's going to happen there. We have people in Gaza trying to find a place to, uh, to, to be safe, uh, which is not easy. More people are dead. More b bodies have been found in this country. So we are on the verge of what looks like a major military endeavor by Israel to destroy the Hamas military infrastructure. It will be a while, and it will not be pretty. MH, we were expecting to hear from the president a little bit later on this afternoon, and some people are expecting perhaps some comments on the nature of the retaliation. What are you expecting to hear? Well, the president's going to strike a tone, one Jonathan, of commander in chief. He's going to talk about the unwavering, unequivocal support the U.S. has for Israel. Potentially, he'll talk about a new tranche of aid that the U.S. could send to Israel. This comes after the U.S. sent uh, warships over the weekend, moving closer to Israel in the eastern Mediterranean. And then also, Jonathan, he's going to strike the tone of consular in chief. 
This is a president that will likely, m most immediately when he comes out, talk about the 11 American lives that have been lost, the potential that that death toll can increase, and also, Jonathan, the fact that it is likely that there are American hostages in Gaza taken by Hamas. We already know that the president in this statement he put out yesterday talked about the fact that he has his team working with their counterparts to try to track down the, any Americans that are there. And also, we do know that the FBI as well has put this as their top paramount concern. Anne-Marie, Ethan, to the both of you, thank you. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy weighing in on the latest developments in the Middle East, writing the following. Geopolitical experts shouldn't be trusted by investors today for the Middle East direction of travel. Israeli intelligence and U.S. intelligence didn't anticipate the Hamas attack. Neither did those who hold themselves out to markets as geopolitical risk experts, who now will overcompensate. Terry, I'm pleased to say, joins us now. Terry, let's walk through the big, big question I think we all have at the moment, and that was whether there was direct involvement to the actions that we saw over the weekend from Hamas, from Iran. The answer to that question, Terry, is going to be difficult to get in the coming days, but does that shape the ultimate response from Israel in the coming weeks and months? I think it's a contributing factor in, in the Israeli response, certainly. It's a, also a contributing factor in exactly how the United States responds. Uh, I, there's been a lot of good reporting on Iran, and. Uh, uh, so far, it has more credibility than the uh, the cautious non-denial denials of the United States side. Um, what I'll also point out is uh, Senate Republican Leader McConnell going out yesterday in a Wall Street Journal piece saying, among other things, that uh, it ought to be a priority of the United States not only to increase defense spending in real terms, something I've been predicting for months, but I mean, not because of this. Uh, but, but that's generally been the Republican posture. But also, because, also McConnell saying that we really have to get to grips with Iran and uh, and deal with the Iranian question much more forcefully than we have been. So uh, that's going to be top of mind for a lot of United States policymakers. And Terry, in your mind, have we turned a blind eye to Iranian crude production in the last few months? I think what we've done is. Uh, I wouldn't say a blind eye necessarily, but I think it's the triumph of hope over experience more than anything else. Um, and I think we've been a little feckless about how we've gone about it. Uh, and I think the, uh, the the question of the Iranian six billion is really the tip of the iceberg. There, the uh, the non enforcement of sanctions also sends a uh, exactly the wrong message at the wrong time. We started this conversation about the potential for escalation abroad. Let's talk about the dysfunction at home. I was reading your note yesterday evening. It pushed back against a lot of happy talk in Washington, D.C. I've used some of your language and ask you the question, if you believe this is a transformative moment for the dysfunction plaguing Washington, D.C.? Um, you know, as a citizen, I wish it were, but it's not. Um, you know, what you have is a situation where, um, you know, markets now are starting to pay attention to debt and deficit uh, in the United States and fiscal spending in the United States for the first time in at least a generation. Uh, and what you've got is a, is is very small ball in Washington. You've got a uh, dispute over essentially uh, whether or not 1% out of 30% of the uh, of the annual spending of uh, above line spending in the United States uh, is going to be cut or not. Uh, that is not the response markets looking are looking for. And generally speaking, I can't uh, I can't imagine that anybody thinks that's a uh, a comprehensive response uh, to the kind of out of control over a generation spending problem that we've now been accustomed to. You heard the conclusions people were drawing Terry off the back of the events over the weekend, the absolute massacre that played out in parts of Israel. A speaker selection odds higher, a shutdown odds lower. A lot of people started to assume they were. Terry, what do you say back to those people? Um, I, I, I think you're absolutely wrong uh, about that. The, the, the House will take the time it needs to put together a speaker uh, uh, vote. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, partially reporting, partially instinct, uh, I don't think they're, uh, they're close to that. Uh, that doesn't mean they won't get it in the next week or two. Uh, but they're not close to that today, I don't think, uh, as we speak. Uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, when you're thinking about lowered shutdown odds, what you're th what, really what you're saying is that you don't take the House Republicans seriously on their desires to cut spending and actually have more border security. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, events so far uh, prove that wrong. Uh, you know, the bottom line, I think, is that 
uh, you're going to have a situation here where uh, shutdown is still going to be a reality for some time. Uh, as I've said to you before, John, there is a three-month window here. Uh, defense spending probably doesn't get finished before the end of the year. And uh, when it does, everything else snaps into place. If the defense spending timeline speeds up as a result of this, no evidence that it will today, uh, then you'll see a speed up uh, and a likely shutdown diminishment. Until then, things haven't changed. Terry Haynes, thank you, sir. With the reality check over at Pangea, if you believe the selection odds for Speaker of the House are higher, shutdown odds are lower, Terry has a message for you. You're wrong. Coming up, the morning calls and later, John Hancock's Emily Rowland recommending investors start buying more defensive sectors in the equity market. That conversation is just around the corner. The price action at the moment shaping up as follows going into the opening bell. Equities up by 0.2% on the S&P 500. Two days of gains. Can we make it day three? And in the bond market, a big rally. Yields are lower by 11 or 12 basis points. Your yield on a 10-year, 4.69. The haven flows kicking in. The Treasury market missed out on them yesterday, given that it was closed. Throw in some dovish Fed speak from Logan, Jefferson and Daly in the last week and the rally commences. From New York, this is Bloomberg. about five minutes away from the up and about this Tuesday morning. We are pushing higher by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Two days of gains. Can we make it day three on the Nasdaq higher by just 0.02%? Bond market rally looks like this. The rally continues. Yields are lower by about 10 basis points on a 10-year. So let's call it 470 on a two-year, a break of 5%. We're down about 10 basis points on the day. 498.43. The haven flows into the Treasury market picking up this morning. Closed yesterday, of course, in the Treasury market. And throw in some dovish Fed speak. Tons more Fed speak a little bit later on in the session. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, JP Morgan downgrading Corning to neutral ahead of earnings, citing concerns about the company's growth prospects. Next up, UBS upgrading Rivian to buy $24 price target, pointing to an improving setup and strengthening fundamentals. And finally, Bank of America upgrading electronic arts to buy, highlighting the stock's attractive valuation and multiple tailwinds heading into earnings. Their stock is up by 1.3%. Coming up, John Hancock's Emily Rowland making the case for defence. That conversation is coming up next. Your opening bell is just around the corner. two-day rally on the S&P 500 going back to August. Can we add to it? About 20 seconds away from the opening bound this morning. Good morning to you. Positive by 0.2% on the S&P on the Nasdaq up by 0.1. Lots to talk about in the bond market. Your equity market opening bell rings. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this. Lower by 10 or 11 basis points and potentially one of the biggest one day moves lower we've had going back to spring 469.45 on a US 10 year yield this morning with that some dollar weakness some euro strength 105.92 after briefly breaking 106 that currency pair positive by a quarter of 1% and WTI crude 86.30 positive by 0.1% negative rather by 0.1% this morning the broader market about 20 seconds into the session let's see how positive we are on the S&P 500 we are higher by 0.2% a very similar move on the Nasdaq one stock to watch at the open is PepsiCo reporting better than expected Q3 results and raising its outlook the CFO saying this overall it's a pretty healthy consumer when they fill up their tank they're still buying a Pepsi and a bag of chips. Abby, I'm not sure if that makes them a healthy consumer or not, but that's <laughs> not, your call. I'm not sure either, John. And they're also talking about one of the snacks that's really driving sales right now are uh, their Doritos spicy pineapple jalapeno chips. I'm not so sure that that would be appealing to me, but they did put up a really strong quarter here and the stock is having its best day since July uh, 13th. So they beat uh, earnings uh, handily. Revenue rose 7%, but what's so interesting about it has everything to do with hiking prices. This is the seventh quarter in a row where they have hiked prices uh, by double digits. Sales volumes, on the other hand, uh, fell by 2.5%. And they're saying that the price hikes reflect items such as uh, the cost of cooking oil going 
getting higher into some of those snacks that they need to produce. Now, also interesting, John, is they talked about these appetite suppressing drugs last week or the week before, actually. Walmart disclosed that they think that they're seeing less demand for food as investors, or excuse me, consumers are shopping less for food as they are taking these appetite suppressing drugs, causing people to want to eat less. Pepsi is saying they are not seeing that, but they're on the outlook for it. And if they were to see it, maybe they would change to smaller snacks or different snacks along those lines. In fact, John, they've actually raised the full year view. So PepsiCo off of its highs, but nonetheless, a nice result. Upgrading the guidance, Abby, thank you. We're high by 0.7%. They're turning to China. Hardly talked about this story this morning. U.S. listed Chinese stocks moving higher after we've reported that Beijing is considering a new round of stimulus measures, as well as raising its budget deficit for 2023. Simone Foxman on top of this one. Hey, Simone. Hey, John. Yeah, that Bloomberg scoop, one of the main drivers we're seeing for this enthusiasm in U.S. listed Chinese shares, that chi that enthusiasm was present during the Asian session. Um, according to this, these sources, uh, measures include issuing at least one trillion yuan of additional sovereign debt. That's roughly one hundred thirty seven billion dollars to spend on infrastructure like water conservancy. Um, this is infrastructure spending is the classic way for the Chinese government to really boost an anemic economy. We already saw the provincial governments go out uh, and uh, issue more debt, accelerating their pace of issuance as well. Now, Credit Agrico CIB describes this issuance as modest, but the message is positive. And Titan Asset Management uh, says this is likely going to focus a lot on the tech sectors. You're looking at some of those tech names on your board right now, and one that's not here as well. But leading the charge in early trading is Billy Billy. Shares there up 5.2%. One of the other reasons we may see this enthusiasm concentrated in the tech names is that a joint statement from a bunch of Chinese agencies um, said the government is targeting adding more than 300 exaflops of computing capacity across the tech sector. Now, an exaflop is a measure of performance for a supercomputer that can calculate one quintillion, so 10 to the 18th floating point operations in a second. Plans to build up additional 20 smart computing centers, bigger optical networks, advanced data centers through 2025. So that enthusiasm around those plans may also be what's carrying through into these names today. It sounds like a big number, that's for sure. Simone, thank huge. you. <laughs> Alibaba up by 1.9%. Let's turn to the autos. UBS upgrading Rivian to buy, seeing a better setup following a recent capital raise. The analysts saying this, with the raise out of the way, the market can refocus on improving fundamentals with capital likely not needed until the end of 2025. Ed Ludlow tracking this. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. The response to Rivian announcing a $1.5 billion convertible debt deal has been mixed, as you'd expect on the sell side. UBS, as you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of positive on this, saying that, A, it removes the question over the need to raise capital, and they now think that Rivian will not need to raise capital through at least 2025. Um, mixed, because you think back to uh, yesterday, Wedbush had a very different view, cutting its price target on Rivian and basically labeling the convertible as a misstep. Last Thursday, the session after they'd announced the convertible, the stock fell 23%, the biggest drop on record. And where Rivian stands now is they have $9 billion of cash on hand. Um, UBS are going with the positive, saying that this shores up the balance sheet, but they also now can focus back on the fundamentals. Um, a big under, sort of underlying story is that Rivian has not really budged guidance from the 52,000 units that it plans to build this year. And there's like this growing frustration amongst investors about how Rivian's leadership communicate with investors on timing. When they announced the convert on October 4th, some on the sell side said, well, this happened a bit sooner than we thought. It will obviously have a dilutory effect on the interests of current shareholders going forward. All in all, it's a company that's building EVs, different from others. Ed, thank you, mate. Stock's up by 2.5%. Looking forward to the programme a little bit later with Ed Ludlow and Caroline Hyde, Bloomberg Technology at noon Eastern time. Do two things right now. Take a look at the bond market. Big rally, yields lower. Take a look at the banks. That positive correlation between treasuries and banks continues. Treasuries rallying. Banks running as well. Bank of America up by about 1.7%. Going into earnings next week. JP Morgan kicking things off 
on Friday. Those results just around the corner. Let's turn to the financials. Truist reportedly in talks to sell the rest of its insurance brokerage to private equity firm Stonepoint Capital for roughly 10 billion US dollars. The CEO saying earlier this year the unit has continued to perform extraordinarily well and we will continue exploring strategic options to maximize shareholder value. Katie Greifert has this one. Hey Katie. Hey John. Yeah Truist up more than 5% on the heels of that semaphore report that like you said the regional banks in talk to sell the rest of its insurance unit over to Stone Point for about 10 billion dollars. Now remember Stone Point led the investor group earlier this year that bought about 20 percent of the insurance business for about 1.95 billion dollars. Now it appears that Stone Point is coming for the remainder, though according to some of our reporting, it's important to note that talks have yet to reach a conclusion and may depend in part on Stone Point's ability to obtain financing. Now Truist might be motivated here to sell as part of its efforts to shore up its balance sheets. We all remember what happened with the banks in March and Wall Street seems to be welcoming this move. Uh, City actually wrote that the remaining sale for the stake for 10 billion dollars that would imply a quote larger valuation of 12 billion dollars or about 2 billion greater than February's original common equity valuation. So the valuation going up here would definitely help explain the rally that we're seeing this morning. True is currently up about 5.3 percent. Katie thank you. John Hancock's Emily Rowland with this to say we're again on the macro environment saying the equity market is telling us that high yields are going to make things harder for more cyclical businesses as restrictive borrowing costs hurt the consumer. Against this backdrop we would consider adding defensive stocks like healthcare and utilities which are now on sale. Emily I'm pleased to say joins us right now. Emily let's go there. Utilities are on sale because of high yields. Consumer discretionary is down because of high yields. Why do I want to avoid one and buy the other? Yeah, John, we see a lot of challenges coming up for the U.S. consumer um, based on really the higher cost of capital. So what's happened is that you've seen better economic data in the U.S. So we look at things last week like the ISM manufacturing index coming in at 49.0 with new orders at 49.2. So picking up, you've got jolts coming in better at 9.6 million. Uh, that blowout jobs report last week, let's not forget it, 336,000 was significant upward revision. So what's happening right now is the stronger economic data really means that the U.S. Federal Reserve is probably going to be the last hawkish central bank standing. The downside to this is that there's even more tightening being put into the system. So we look at 30-year mortgage rates, you know, hitting a 23-year high last week, mortgage applications hitting a 27-year low. So we think what happens here is that there are significant challenges here, not only to the housing market, but also to the broader economy. So if you lean into less cyclical areas of the market, um, parts that have not as much of a need to tap the capital markets, more durable profitability, less of an interest burden. That's where we think investors should go. So it's really about this combination of quality and defense uh, that we think makes sense in portfolios. Emily, when we get the bank earnings on Friday and through next week, are you expecting those results to speak to that slowdown you're anticipating? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what everybody is looking for is are we going to get a read on, on the U.S. consumer? And when we look at earnings growth more broadly for this quarter, this is the last quarter where negative earnings growth estimates are being penciled in for the market. So the bar is pretty low. Um, when we look into the financial sector, about 9.3 percent earnings growth is expected for this quarter. There are some tailwinds there for the financials. We've seen a, a doubling of interest rates. Uh, since Q3 of last year, remember the Fed funds rate was only between about one and three percent uh, this time last year. However, the yield curve was steeper last year, so that could play into things. And then, of course, we'll look to see how those loan loss provisions uh, get factored in as these challenges to the consumer persist. I think the consumer is fine uh, right now. Certainly, uh, you know, we talked about the the employment dynamics, the labor market's really healthy. Consumers are still OK, but I think there's a lot of mounting evidence that they may be starting to pull back here again as the cost of borrowing is so elevated. I mean, we talk a lot about the relationship between the bond market and stocks, the broader equity market. Can we talk about the relationship between <laughs> treasuries and banks? What do you make of that through this year so far? Is that going to change anytime soon? Yeah, it's really odd. So normally financials trade on, on higher interest rates and that relationship is really broken down. But we haven't seen a backup in rates to this extent 
really in modern history. We have to go back a really long way to see a Federal Reserve that's raising rates by over 5% in an 18-month time frame. Uh, that's just really extraordinary. So I think markets, investors are more focused on how that changes the narrative in terms of tipping the economy into recession. We all know that the Fed hikes until something breaks, and everybody's getting incredibly impatient to sort of wait and, and see how that plays out and how the economy ultimately tips into recession as this tide of liquidity is removed from the system. But that's really what, what, we, what we see, I think, Treasury markets reacting more to, or banks reacting more to now, is how is that challenge to the consumer? How is that challenge from tighter financial conditions going to impact banks? They're more cyclical. They're not our favorite thing for a late cycle environment. Emily, what is your favorite thing for a late cycle environment? Yeah, so again, it's this combination, I think, of quality and defense. So I think there's going to be a big change in consumer behavior. People might not buy that next consumer discretionary item, uh, but they're still going to turn the lights on and, and take a shower and, and go to the doctor and, I guess, eat those Doritos. Um, so I think that um, <laughs> sounds terrible to me, but I'm sure my 13-year-old would love those. So I think you're going to see a bid for the things that people need to do. So areas like utilities, defense, think infrastructure, think toll roads, data centers. Um, I think those are areas that we like. Healthcare has got a 20% return on equity. It's actually trading at a 10% discount to the S&P 500. So those are areas that have sort of been left in the dust until very recently. And we think that the baton can be handed over to them as we head into the back half of this year and into 2024. Let's put a bow on it. You're looking for a slowdown. Morgan Stanley has said they're looking for a noticeable slowing in Q4. We had two guests to start this program today, <laughs> Emily. Jim Bianco, one over at Bianco Research. Mike Contopoulos over at RB Advisors, who said they're not looking for a slowdown. Why do you think it's different this time after we've seen so many people get this call wrong time and time and again yeah. through 2023? Well, it's a timing thing, and I, and I listen to Jim, and, and I agree with him. I think things could be okay for a little while longer. You know, you look at the yield curve inversion. We're at about 12 months right now. You look at, you know, if you look at the Fed funds and 10-year rate, you look at the leading indicators, they've been negative for about 13 months. We have had periods where those dynamics have persisted for 16 to 18 months. Um, it was back in 06, 07 as the, as the latest example. But, you know, the economy is reaccelerating. 336,000 jobs. We don't have a problem right now. Um, so I think in earnings season, the bar is low. You could get decent earnings in the fourth quarter. So I think it's a timing thing. You know, we could see three to six months of pretty decent economic growth and pretty good um, signs from, from the corporate side. I think it's after that especially as expectations are so elevated now and there's animal spirits in the market that are driving markets higher, that's the challenge into 2024. Emily, thank you for the update. Emily Rowland of JH Investments. We are about 13, 14 minutes into the session. We're positive by 0.2% on the S&P. Coming up, House Republicans preparing to choose a new speaker. This is about a moment in time. This is about what America's going to do. I'll allow the conference to make whatever decision. Whether I'm speaker or not, I'm a member of this body. I know what history has had, and I can lead in any position it is. The latest from Capitol Hill, up next. Unfortunately, the House can do nothing without a speaker. I could be upset with eight, but I could be upset with every single Democrat as well. They both made the same decision, a political decision, instead of putting America first. This is about a moment in time. This is about what America's going to do. I'll allow the conference to make whatever decision. Whether I'm speaker or not, I'm a member of this body. I know what history has had, and I can lead in any position it is. Former Speaker Kevin McCarthy willing to make a comeback, jabbing Democrats and Republicans alike for playing politics in the wake of deadly attacks on Israel. Without someone at the top job, congressional business grinds to a halt, even with bipartisan support for Israel in the chamber. Henry Trey's of Veda Partners weighing in. My hope is that we see the um, invasion of Israel really shake some things loose here in D.C. One of the things I'd like to see happen here is Israeli aid move the Speaker's election along. Candidates Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan vying for their colleagues' approval in a forum this afternoon before a secret ballot election 
on Wednesday. Your team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie and Kelly Lyons in Washington, D.C. Kelly, first to you. Just walk us through the timeline for this election. 5 p.m. tonight, John, is when the Republican conference will be meeting to hear from the two front-running candidates for the speaker's gavel. That, of course, is Jim Jordan, the Republican from Ohio, chair of the Judiciary Committee, really a hardline conservative firebrand who appeals much more to that faction of the Republican Party and, of course, has gotten the endorsement of former President Donald Trump. Then there's Steve Scalise, a longtime member of House leadership. He has been the number two Republican, appeals more to some of the moderates within the party. But at this point, the math doesn't work for either of them. It just does not seem that either of them can garner enough votes to get the majority they need in order to actually get the gavel, which is why we're hearing increasing muttering here in Washington about a potential McCarthy speakership 2.0. We, of course, just heard here McCarthy didn't necessarily rule it out when speaking at the Capitol yesterday, said he will do what the conference wishes. And there actually have been a number of Republican members who already have voiced support for a return of Kevin McCarthy to the speakership. The issue is the math doesn't really work easily for him either, remembering that eight Republicans joined with every single Democrat to oust him just last week. So we would have to figure out a way to win some of the votes back. At this point, it's a very fractious looking caucus, but they are going to try to coalesce around one candidate behind closed doors to avoid the embarrassment of bringing this vote to the floor and having to go another, say, 15 rounds like it took to get McCarthy the speaker's gavel back in January. So this could be a protracted process as they try to get one individual a majority that they need. And, of course, that voting, John, will begin tomorrow. Anne-Marie, one subject, aid for Israel. Does this complicate things at all? Well, it absolutely does, Jonathan. House representatives cannot move forward with any sort of bill or legislation regarding anything including aid for Israel, until they have a Speaker of the House. So they're at an impasse right now. Uh, but we do know in terms of aid for Israel, though, Jonathan, is that a group of lawmakers over the weekend had discussions with the White House. The White House will say it's too premature right now. But a discussion about linking Ukrainian aid with Israel aid. They view this as a way to potentially get some of these Republicans that do not want to move forward with Ukrainian aid to capitalize on the fact that they do want to move forward with aid for Israel. But one representative, Tom Cole, said this isn't fair. Israel should be addressed separately when it, than when it comes to Ukraine. But, Jonathan, these are the type of questions we will see only after there's a Speaker of the House. And marie there was a feeling after the weekend that maybe this would provide some urgency to Washington. Terry Haynes, earlier on this program, he said Speaker selection odds aren't higher. He said shutdown odds aren't lower. What's the consensus view in Washington at the moment, Anne marie I would agree with the prob probability of that and the math around it. As Kaylee pointed out, it's going to be very difficult for one individual to emerge with getting to that magic number of 217. But I would say there is a growing urgency that this Republican Party needs to get its act together because they have now a long list of issues to address. And most notably, on top of that, given all their comments over the weekend, that's going to be standing strong and supplying, supplying support to, to Israel. MH, thank you. Alongside Kelly Lines, Balance of Power a little bit later on, together with Joe Matthew at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Television. About 22 minutes into the session, equities advance a quarter of 1% on the S&P, up 0.3 on the Nasdaq. Let's get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. The sector action this morning, John, is a little peculiar in the fact that uh, the sectors on bottom, those that are underperforming, those are the dividend-sensitive sectors, the rate-sensitive sectors. So with yields down so much, you would think that healthcare and real estate would be rallying in a big way, uh, tech as well. That said, we're looking at pretty small declines, so I wouldn't be surprised if those sectors join the other sectors. Consumer discretionary, the best sector on the day, up 1%, having to do uh, with PepsiCo in part. Consumer staples, also a great sector, up 9 tenths of 1%. And there are strong dividends there. So there we are seeing some of the more normal action relative uh, to dividends and rates being down so much. As for energy, well, it's, it is higher by just a little bit. This as oil uh, is essentially lower by just a little bit consolidating the gains. But take a look at the move up out of the, the June and May lows up about 16 percent. Lots of volatility, though, John. Last week down about 10 percent, now up about 5 percent. It almost looks like there could be a V bottom there, suggesting that maybe the gains for the energy sector, they are going to continue. Abby, thank you. Really busy week ahead. Tons of data, lots of Fed speak. The headline data point comes on Thursday. CPI just around the corner. Up next on the program, I'll get you that trading diary.
25 minutes into the session, the rally goes into day three on the S&P, up a quarter of 1%. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary coming up. And what you need to be looking for, President Biden discussing Israel at 1 p.m. Eastern from the White House. Fed speed continues through the day. Waller, Kashgari and Daly all on deck. Wednesday, US PPI and Fed minutes and House Republicans planning to hold elections for the next speaker. Thursday, US CPI and another round of jobless claims. And on Friday, to round out the week, Big bank earnings kicking off with JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citigroup. From New York City, that is it for me. Thank you very much for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.